are your racks now the 21 inch racks no so um actually they're not 19 inch racks they're not 20 they're not 19 racks. they're not 21 so huh? the, the first version and the second version of open, open compute servers um what is the pitch of that thing it's around 20 inches or so um it, it was really designed from the ground up uh, and yeah. we started from the inside and then worked our way out around the infrastructure so the key components over there are obviously like the motherboard and the power supply and we yeah. built around the form factor that housed those in a very efficient way uh, and then uh, whatever dimensions we ended up for the infrastructure around there we just kind of let it be because it was the right thing to do to get the most efficient system yeah. um, looking at uh, looking forward with open rack uh, this idea there is to keep as much flexibility as possible yeah. in the design so that we don't need to go and um, revisit the design of the rack and the power infrastructure every couple years, right? Because the reality is um, rack technology, power supply technology, and other technologies over there don't have that quick of refresh cycles uh, when you compare it to the commodities that go in there, like the CPU, the yeah. RAM, and the drives. So if we can create a nice big platform um, that allows us to be creative in this area, the more room we have, the more creative we can be, and then the less likely we'll want to go ahead and refresh that technology yeah. in the future. So we start off with a nice big pitch, that allows for a lot of flexibility, many, many different types of configurations yeah. can go in there. Um, and the idea behind that is all this all this infrastructure, refreshing it costs money, it has environmental impact. If we can yeah. keep it for a couple generations of servers, then it's a big win for us. And it's a big win for anyone who uses that type of thing. Uh, but it's something that you can only really uh, do if you take it, if you publish it, and uh, the specifications, and yeah. if you let um, uh, other people build to that standard, right? If you were to do that and keep yeah. it for yourself, it would be hard to get um, um, server refreshes in there. But the fact that we're taking it, opening yeah. it up, allows other people to build for that, sure. that size too. They're talking about racks, because I know you know the racks that I see in the data centers I used to manage, they'd been there 10 years before I got there, and I'm not that old. Yeah. When are, how often are you refreshing racks, even in the existing data centers, or is it just a refresh for like, I know you're building this massive data center in North Sweden. Huh? Uh, I would assume new stuff will head in there, but do you refresh the existing physical racks, you know, the six foot? Sure, sure. So Facebook is still uh, relatively young as far as its infrastructure goes. Yeah. We don't do a whole lot of refresh right now. Most of it is net new builds at this point. Um, the, uh, um, the uh, how often do we refresh? I would say uh, at some point the, in the strategy we implement behind this is to look at the performance we get from a particular system. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's how many web requests um, we can host on it or how many uh, photos we can put on that particular device. Sure. And then we look at the infrastructure required to maintain it and the energy required to maintain it most importantly. right? How much power is going into generating each uh, page view sure. into storing each photo. And at some point it, it really falls out of favor where the amount of energy that we're spending on it uh, when compared to newer technology, uh, might be higher for older technology, and that's yeah. where we make the cut over to refresh to new technology. Good. So it's not just you know every year Intel's got their new chip, and you're not following their chip cycles then and ripping them out. So uh, interesting uh, enough, at that point, those uh, because Intel manages to, to remain very creative and very innovative sure. in, that, in that regard. Every time they have, or any silicon vendor has a new version, we typically find that we get. Um, greater performance at the same power and roughly around the same cost as well. So for all net new products that go in there, they typically revolve around the latest and greatest pieces of silicon that are coming from vendors. Good. Um, the way I remember Frank explained open rack was uh, racks done right like blades, so you pull things out. So within the rack infrastructure you have now, if I wanted to just pull out a compute blade, as it were, whatever right. you guys are calling it in your Facebook terminology. I know you guys have all kinds of good words. Still a server. Still a server. Uh -huh. uh, but if I just want to pull out that physical compute CPU memory, is it so modular such that I'm just pulling it in and out of, I guess, a PCIe <laughs> slot, or, or how is it configured? So not quite. Uh, what we've done on OpenRack is we've gone ahead and created a shared infrastructure for power mainly. Right. So okay. when you pull something out, you're not pulling out any power supplies with it. There's a bus bar in the back that interfaces power. Now, technologies that are high-speed interconnects, like say, for example, PCIe, like you mentioned, yeah. or like network, um, or like uh, SAS for drive interconnect, sure. those things are expensive to embed into backplanes. Uh, we're actually finding that cables 
uh, are more cost effective, but it also allows us not to tie ourselves to a particular generation of technology, right? The ultimately, power, um, like I mentioned before, probably won't refresh as fast as those other technologies, so it made sense to embed that. Um, but the cost of embedding something higher speed, something that changes at a faster pace, um, made it uh, uh, made us decide not to embed those into the rack itself. So what you're doing is you're actually pulling out a server, but before you pull it out, you're going to unplug all the high-speed interfaces, your 10 gig uh, network connection, your SAS connection, and then you pull out the server. What's the shift in the balance from your perspective, ARM, x86, low power, and how does that all roll out? Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, the way we're, uh, we think about that is we're always looking for the solution that allows us to support the most amount of work at the lowest cost and power possible, right? It's a mix between those, those yeah. three things that come up with what our, um, our model is when we use to select a processor. Um, uh, today, the majority of that goes to x86. We're always looking at alternate architectures all the time because if we're not surveying, we're not going to know if there's a shift uh, in the market at that point. And we're also keeping that in mind that, hey, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that um, uh, x86 or code written specifically for x86 is always going to be the way that we need to develop our infrastructure. So we're working on ways for allowing our infrastructure to shift uh, to non-x86 platforms too. Uh, we found a lot of good success on the caching side, for example. Uh, we published a paper where we used a Telera processor uh, and got great performance on cache. Um, so we're always um, interested in, in, in any type of, of silicon processor that, or non-silicon for that matter, that can, that can allow us to uh, um, get a better value as far as our, our, our modeling goes. Good. Uh, and then since you roll your own for everything, uh, you know, if I was buying from Dell, HP, etc., yeah. I would have used uh, OpenView or Dell's Power Manager, Power Connect, etc. What's the server management tech that you're using from an infrastructure point of view when you're looking just to see that everything is up and running and right. all the other good stuff that needs to be done? We actually use a very limited set of uh, management functions right now. Uh, really what we care about is uh, remote console access and a remote method for rebooting the server. Um, those two basic functions allow us to do everything that we want to do over there. Uh, if a kernel hangs or something like that, we need to go and kick the server so that I can come back online. And it's, you can't send out a technician every time that happens. Sure. Um, and so uh, what we did actually with the first version of open, open Compute was something that we called Reboot on LAN, where we took the Wake on LAN packet and we wired its circuitry up to the reboot system of our motherboard. So you would send it a, a Wake on LAN packet and the system would reboot. Yeah. Uh, and that was how we managed the majority of our servers at the time. Huh. Um, second round um, of open compute servers, we wanted to add uh, serial console functionality over there. Um, and embedded in Intel's chipset is a management engine, uh, which allows it to, to provide that, that serial console over a network port. And so uh, without any adding any additional hardware, uh, we used some features of the management engine, tied it into our network interface, and can now um, get console access to the servers as well. Um, and it came at almost at almost no additional cost on the servers as well. So for those two, two generations of servers, yeah. we added management without actually adding the cost of management, without actually paying for uh, BMC or baseband management control. Yeah. Or, which is typically like an ARM9 processor that sits yeah. on the motherboard and you need some DRAM and some passive components and other yeah. things on there. Probably end up um, you know, with adding more cost to the system by doing that, but we're able to strip all that out but keep all the functionality in. And then on the software side, uh, when you're looking at it, that you know your workstation, what kind of dashboard do you have so that you, you, know, you, you, you have all that visibility because you're not going into the rows to see what's going on? Yeah. Um, our requirement, so I'm not as familiar with the exact specifics of the dashboards that our engineers are monitoring. Yeah. Uh, I do know that um, using things like LEDs to indicate fail failures or yeah. having that as the sole source of a failure indication is completely not acceptable. Right? Yeah. Every failure needs to have some sort of reporting mechanism that happens over the network at that point. Um, we aggregate all of those into a localized database and we keep a lot a lot of data on the activity of our servers, yeah. on uh, errors that we might see on drives, errors that we might uh, log into DRAM. Um, and we look at that, we can use that data, first of all, for the obvious, which is to go out and repair hardware when it fails. Um, also, we can use that to try and predict failure rates and monitor failure rates of different yeah. types of hardware uh, and keep a tab on the hardware to know if we came across perhaps a bad batch of hardware, for example. We might need to go ahead and, re and repair that. Uh, yeah. 
Um, we did a couple of interesting things as far as um, error logging as well in the BIOS too. If you look at our specifications, we actually use part of the non-volatile memory in the BIOS. Um, when we see a, a major error in the hardware, if it's a bit error on DRAM or a PCIe bus error, we'll actually log it into, um, first thing we'll do is we'll log it into the BIOS, the non-volatile part of the BIOS. If the system crashes and burns and hangs, then um, so be it. Well, upon a reboot, we can go back into the BIOS yeah. and read that log and see exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the next big thing for, for, for open compute beyond you know, storage? But is, is there a key milestone, or is it just a bunch of continuing efforts and continuing to get collaboration, more people contributing? Right. Um, I think that you know, we're just a year and a half into the project. We're already seeing a lot of momentum and a lot of interest, which is awesome. Um, it, it's sort of um, uh, you know, like... like uh, like a project, just like any other open source project, that requires time to build up the momentum for people for it to gain people to gain interest on it, right? And that's actually one of the exciting parts is how quickly that momentum is forming. But obviously, um, uh, as time goes on, you gain more and more and more, and people begin to adopt more and more and more. And I think that's really the interesting part is seeing how, and we're already starting to see this. Um, people look at what we've done, apply a lot of the same principles that we've developed even perhaps reuse parts that we've developed uh, and then come up with something new from it. And that's really cool. Um, for example, we have a new server design that came from the financial industry. And they said, hey, you guys did a cool job for web caching servers. We have a slightly different problem set, but we like your approach. And we're going to take your learnings and here's how we're going to implement it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and then here's the spec as well. We'll open source it and go along with you. So a lot of um, and that's really what, what I think is cool and what, what's going to be the next big thing for our open computers as people start to release more and more of their ideas and share more and more in this community. Um, then it gets a lot more fun, a lot more exciting, and it, and it allows you to think about hardware uh, from a different angle because perhaps, uh, and I know this for sure, our designs weren't the best. And getting people to uh, uh, contribute and provide commentary on mm -hmm. it is really valuable feedback that you don't get otherwise.